at 13, May Martin was doing improv at Second City in Toronto, and by 15, winning award for her comedy. So it's not all that surprising that she's now the creator and star of the terrific Netflix series, Feel Good. Yet for all the success, there were certainly bumps along the way. We're very pleased to welcome from London, UK, May Martin. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you too. Really I'm nice sure you've heard- Hear a Canadian accent, it's very comforting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you hear this all the time. Um, I binged, watched uh, Feel Good. Uh, I think it, the first day it came out and it was really interesting to see how it felt like Canada was like a character uh, in this series. Was that intentional? Oh, good. I'm really glad. Yeah. Yeah. It was important to represent represent Canada. And uh, yeah, I've definitely had a kind of fish out of water experience being a Canadian in England. So that was an important part of it. And we had a, a Canadian director as well. So it made sense. And we also need to talk about your music uh, sense because you, <laughs> in the series, you get a tattoo. Well, your character gets a tattoo of some 41. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fictional. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's total fictional. Well, let's yeah, take a yeah. look at uh, let's take a look at the clip of Feel Good. Hi guys, I'm from Canada. I came over in a canoe recently with Celine Dion. Do you want to kiss me, mate? I thought that would be so cool. Now, yes. Your father and I want to know if you found a new narcotics anonymous uh, um, meeting. What meeting? I may, I'm an addict. Where do you get this? In jail. As you know, I am an addict. Oh, Jesus. New me, new life. I have everything under control. She's always had a very addictive personality. I don't know where she gets that from. Well, are you dating anyone? I am seeing someone, but she's kind of an asshole, so I don't think it's going to last. Hey, what do you want to know? Everything. This show is based on your life. Um, how does your depiction of May in this show compare to your real life? Um, I think that the emotional truth is very, very accurate. And, and she, but she's kind of dialed up to 100, the, the depiction of me. So I think in my real life, I'm a little more sordid and I, I uh, am not teetering on the edge as much as that character. But she's kind of where I was at about 10 years ago in terms of my relationships and addictive behaviors and things like that. So, yeah, but hopefully I think you couldn't write um, a character of yourself without sort of having the self-awareness, hopefully in retrospect to do that. Was there anything in that happened to you in your real life that you stayed away from uh, in the series? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we just tried to build a really compelling narrative and take the themes of addiction and love and sexuality and things that really interest me and have affected my life and then and then narrativize them. So yeah, lots of stuff in real life that didn't go in and lots of stuff in it that didn't happen in real life. But there's definitely an emotional truth there um, that made it quite cathartic and sometimes difficult to film and ultimately very, very rewarding. Why cathartic? Um, I think when you're carrying around, I mean, everybody carries around frustrations and feelings and shame and, and all kinds of things like that. We all do. And so when you're able to authentically speak them out loud and uh, bring them out of the shadows and then, and then see them all edited together like that, it's, it's, uh, it's a relief to know that they'll be heard by other people and people will connect to them. Um, and it, it's nice. It can be alienating not to see your experience reflected on screen. So it's nice to be able to tell your, your personal story. You know? By that, what do you mean not seeing your experience on screen? I, I, yeah, I, I guess with um, representation is still, still a big, a big issue. It's rare that I've seen things like my sex life or, <laughs> or my, romantic life kind of represented in a in a, a real way where it's authored you know this is a, a queer story authored by a, a queer person so there's things in it that I definitely haven't seen before but I hope also it's a very universal um story and lots of different demographics can can relate to it um the show is not just um for me to me anyway um it's not just a love story it's also about what it's like to live with addiction and the challenges and the struggles that come with it. Why did you decide to tell this story uh, this way? I did a stand-up comedy show about addiction and, and my experiences with addiction. And 
and the, I did a lot of research for that show and, and thought a lot about how we kind of relegate conversations about addiction to substance use. And usually we think of addicts as this small group of people who can't handle their, their life. And, and really addictive behavior permeates many aspects of the human experience. And I think a lot of people can relate to doing something compulsively despite it having negative consequences in your life. So whether that's our phones or um, being in relationships that aren't necessarily good for you, I, I wanted to broaden that definition of addiction and see how, um, yeah, how damaging it could be in one person's life and, and make it funny and, and light and not quite so harrowing and heavy as a lot of addiction stories are. Because I think, I think lots of us can connect with that and it's important to uh, humanize addiction i think but addiction is heavy isn't it uh, not always i mean <laughs> i think ever even the heaviest things can have have moments of levity and and humor in them right that that's a very human thing you know i've been in the middle of breakups really intense everybody crying and then somebody says something funny and you laugh for a minute you know i think i think that's very true to the yeah, at least my life. <laughs> well, I read um I read an article um and in the article you said that addiction is mundane. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think that's what what I mean about um what I said about broadening the the definition to to include anything that we're doing compulsively despite knowing the negative consequences and that could be very mundane things, right? We all know that social media is not great for our brains. We know that eating tons of crisps are not great for our bodies, but we do it, you know, as a means of self-soothing, which is not always a bad thing at all, but um, yeah. In the, in Feel Good, there's a lot of tension between May, the character and her family. What is behind that tension? In the show? Yes. Uh, in the show, I, I think, um, well, she's uh, had a very tumultuous adolescence and, and 20s and uh, moved to a new country and hasn't seen her parents in a couple of years. Um, and I guess there's a big disparity in the type of child that her parents anticipated having and the type of child that they've ended up having uh, or the type of adult they've ended up having. Um, so yeah, they're, they're both trying to, they're trying to get along, but they have very different uh, methods of communication and coping. So it's, they butt heads a lot. And in Feel Good, uh, Lisa Kudrow, the Lisa Kudrow, uh, <laughs> plays your mom. Uh, are there any parallels between her character and your mother? The, the parallels are that they're, they're both highly intelligent. They both are very powerful women. They, um, you know, a lot of my inner monologue is just my mom's voice. She's a, a very powerful influence in my life. And, um, and so I, you know, obviously I worry about her approval and that kind of thing. So that's a parallel, but my mom is, we're very close and she's very warm and lovely and supportive. So now it wouldn't be funny to uh, depict great parents. You know, <laughs> you got to dial up the conflict to get that, get the drama and the, and the humor. Now, um, I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too much in your business, um, but <laughs> here we go, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, but in, in the, in the show, um, you have said the show is similar to your life in the show may left home while she was kicked out of her home when she was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. Um, did that happen to you? Yeah. Yeah. I had a very, um, tumultuous teens. Yeah, for sure. That's true. Um, yeah, in Toronto and in, in the comedy community. Uh, I started doing comedy when I was about 13. And then, um, yeah, it's a very adult world. And I went pretty, pretty far off the rails, I'd say. Yeah. And then um, got myself together when I was about 20. So yeah, those are parallels. <laughs> Well, I mean, the fact that you're saying that you got yourself together at 20 is something because there's a lot of people like myself in my 40s still trying to figure it out. But let's just go back oh, a little no, bit. Me too. How did, <laughs> how yeah, did me you too. At, 13, at 13, when I look back at 13, I think I was writing in my diary about why Jeremy doesn't like me. And I'm pretty sure <laughs> that's what I was doing. Um, why? How did you end up doing comedy at 13? I think about it a lot and, and ask that same question. Uh, I think it must have been, I, 
my parents are both really into comedy. They're both very funny and, and, um, you know, raised me watching comedy and, and took me to comedy clubs and stuff. And, and I guess I, you know, maybe there's some, if I really psychoanalyzed it, there's some, some need for approval and, and attention, but, uh, it was just something that I was good at. And I, and I found, um, a, co a community of people who were not only saying the things about themselves that made them different and weird, but being applauded for that and, and getting laughs and validation, which is very different to your average high school experience, right? Where everything weird about you is beaten down and, uh, and, and you want to blend in. So it was nice for me to find this group of people where I could just be the weirdo that I was inside. And yeah, I just loved it. Uh, would you would it be fair to say that maybe that it was your first community because i'm i'm thinking um if you're growing up in toronto um and i don't know when you uh, realize that you were queer but if you are if you probably felt that you didn't fit in and then at 13 like i'm just trying to picture it, you walking into like a, a comedy club <laughs> and getting on stage and people would be like okay there's a 13 year old like doing her thing um yeah would you, like would it be fair to say that maybe you that was the first community that you found yeah maybe well I, I I mean I was I had a lot of friends and I was you know I was always in the school plays and stuff and really uh extroverted and then I think I once I found those improv classes at Second City and met like-minded kids who were a bunch of oddballs you know um then uh, after I did a couple of shows professionally then it snowballed very quickly because I think there was uh I think I got a lot of attention for being so young. So there was a novelty factor there. So then it, it you know, then it snowballs. <laughs> and, and when you were that, when you were um, getting into comedy, who were some of the people that you looked to uh, as inspiration? Well, I had two uh, spheres of influence because I had my dad who's British. And so he brought me up on Monty Python and, and, uh, the goon show and people like that and then my mom who loved steve martin and sctv and the kids in the hall and uh the kids in the hall were huge for me i saw them at massey hall live when i was i guess i was 13 and they just seemed like rock stars to me um you know they're a canadian sketch comedy troupe and then when i started performing at second city there were people that i idolized there like um carolyn taylor who's in a, a tv show now called baroness von sketch show and she was a real idol and is now one of my best friends and we've been friends for 20 years now since I was 13 so yeah and what what has the transition been like for you from moving from obviously you're still doing the comedy but from moving from being on the stage to being an actor I was I was so nervous I did yeah I was terrified I I uh I was just really lucky that I I knew what I needed. So I, I really insisted on having a long rehearsal process and casting people that I found really funny and um, having a director I was really comfortable with. And, and then I absolutely loved it. So I, I started doing sketch and improv when I was really young. And then I've been doing stand-ups for so long, which is such a solitary endeavor. <laughs> and um, it's so nice to not to, you know, finish filming for the day and then go for it, go for a meal with everyone instead of just going back to your hotel room on tour alone. <laughs> I, I find it interesting that you said that you were nervous about doing a show because I'm thinking probably the most terrifying thing for most people would be <laughs> to stand on stage by themselves and then yeah. look, be able to see everybody's face as to whether or not what you're doing is resonating. So why were you nervous about doing, um, about moving into the acting world? Well, for one thing, I think, um, you're, in with stand up i'm i'm totally in control because i'm the only person on stage so i know if it goes really badly i could theoretically just run out the door <laughs> but with acting there's um i mean I, you have, expressing your emotions without irony is pretty scary being vulnerable in that way and then also there's all these variables of other actors and and responding to them and, and what they're doing and and connecting with people and then you add the element of having your um your hero lisa kudrow <laughs> acting opposite you which is really daunting but luckily she was really so sweet to me so that was nice you both had such a great uh chemistry you, it was believable that you were mother and daughter i think so yeah i think we kind of 
almost look alike in a way or, or our mannerisms or something. Yeah, it was perfect. Now, it's so it's weird to say this 20 years you've been in the business um, and I'm sure you've seen many changes along the way. How has the comedy circuit changed since you started at 13? I think the culture has changed, uh, the comedy culture has changed a lot, um, which is great because I, I remember when I started um, as a young teen and I'd be performing at Yuck Yucks or something and um, the, I'd have to go up after an act who was being homophobic or racist or sexist and, and, and doing really well, like the audience was loving it. And then I'd have to go up after them and um, feel a bit like I had to apologize for, for who I was or kind of bridge this awkward tone in the room. And now, um, I mean, comedy audiences are a great microcosm for what's going on in society, right? And what they laugh at and what they don't. So now, definitely, if you were to say something homophobic on stage, you'd get booed and the audience would not be behind you. So that, that's a huge shift and, and thank God, right? And then um, also just, I think, in green rooms and in terms of like sexual misconduct and uh, a general atmosphere of sexual threat, <laughs> that's changing um, slowly. You know, there's now backstage at Just for Laughs, for instance, there's a code of conduct typed out and um, there's no tolerance for, for that kind of behavior. So that's, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like I'm, it's weird to think, it sounds like I'm talking about the 1970s, but you know, we're talking about the early 2000s. It's it's crazy, this huge shift, which has made us all realize how far we had to go. Um, and how much further we still need to go. Um, Absolutely. Considering everything that you were struggling with behind the scenes, looking back now, um, hindsight being 2020, what do you think it was about you that helped you get through not only the struggles that you were dealing with addiction, but also what you were dealing with in your own professional world to get to the point that you are now? Um, two things, I think. One thing is I'm a, I'm a true comedy fan and uh, I, I, I'm just really lucky that I'm passionate about, about comedy and you know, for, for all those negative things that I, that I just said about green rooms and that atmosphere, there are also amazingly talented and funny and kind and supportive people in that community. So you know, there's, there's rocks there that support you. And, um, and then also I'm, I am like em embarrassingly ambitious. So I think ambition, thank God has got me through. And um, why is that embarrassing? Yeah, that's a good point actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it a good thing to be ambitious? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know why I said that. Yeah. Yeah. It is good. I think it's, I guess it's kind of frowned upon to be like, I want to take over the world, you know, but I do. <laughs> well, Mr. Burns from The Simpsons is, you know. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, one thing that I have noticed is that during what's been happening in the world, that people, you know, I work in the media, but we've also done shows on, uh, segments on this show talking about how it seems like people, the public is trusting comedians more than the media. Why do you, how do you... What do you attribute that to? Well, I mean, if you look at our world's leaders, it's uh, it's tricky to know where to turn. I, I definitely would not advise going looking to comedians for your political content. Or um, I, I think now, particularly, it's really, really important that we're all seeking out activists, um, seeking out information and, and statistics and arming ourselves with this knowledge. Um, I've been learning a lot recently. Um, but I guess it makes sense that comedy's always been a kind of counterculture thing and and a, a place where subversive um, commentary can can take place. So, you know, as far back as Lenny Bruce or whatever, or um, Richard Pryor. And so that it makes sense that we're able to criticize the, you know, the status quo and, and the people in power. But I definitely think that uh, you're going to wade into dangerous territory if you're holding comedians up as kind of the sources of all your, your news and your, yeah, 
definitely you gotta you gotta go out and find the activist well on i guess now it's become um social media has become a place where uh myself you um anyone can express their views and recently um someone who you admired uh because you're a harry potter fan um jk uh, Rowling tweeted something and then you tweeted a response. Uh, you tweeted, I can't believe that in this moment at JK Rowling has decided the most useful thing to tweet to her 14.5 million followers is willfully pandemic uh, gender critical turf nonsense. Uh, the world is full of threats worth fighting against. Trans people are not a threat. Hashtag trans women are women. What were you responding to? Um, <laughs> Uh, she had, she, um, I'm sure most people are aware of this at this point that she'd, um, she went on a kind of, uh, you know, you have to be so careful how you, how you phrase things. I guess JK Rowling subscribes to this, uh, small group of feminists who believe that trans rights are a threat to, to cisgendered women's rights. And, um, and so she was, she was speaking out and she's, she's written, like, written an essay recently actually about it's full of misinformation and it's about um the threat of trans women being in single sex spaces like bathrooms and things like that um and a lot of kind of do you call it straw man arguments like she's saying she was saying that trans people don't believe in biology and how and it's it's just incorrect and and i i, I really see especially in the uk right now there's a real hysteria around um, trans rights. They're, they're currently, um, actually JK Rowling's, uh, business partner, who's the co-founder of her charity is currently campaigning to get trans rights removed from the Equality Act. So it's, it's really, a, it's a, a scary time. And, uh, it's, it's all, it's all, uh, hysteria. Trans people are 0.6% of the population. They're disproportionately at risk of violence and, and, and suicide and, um, abuse and, and, uh, so it's just, I think we're going to look back and see how, how ridiculous it is that um, someone with her platform was using this moment where we were sort of supposed to be talking about race. Uh, and she used the moment to talk about, um, you know, the threat of trans women who, who are just being murdered all the time. It's just crazy. I don't know. I could, I could go on for I mean hours. Well, I mean, the reason I brought it up is because um, it was, as you said, she has a huge platform. And uh, when you compare the platform she has to yours, uh, I thought it was interesting that you decided to weigh in. So I guess my question was, why did you decide to weigh in to that particular uh, comment? Um, you know, there aren't many areas that I would feel confident enough to weigh in like that. But um, I... I have done loads of research and I, I wrote a book um, for teens about gender and sexuality called Can Everyone Please Calm Down? And I do, in, in this instance, in this one area, I do feel pretty confident that, um, that I'm right. <laughs> and, that, and I also have a lot of vulnerable um, LGBT kids who, who are my followers and who uh, come to my shows. And I mean, I myself experience a lot of... Uh, panic in in women's bathrooms with people challenging me on on my gender identity so um yeah it matters to me so you know that's my cause that i picked recently to weigh in on well june is pride month and this year obviously it looks very different because of covid19 being a global pandemic how did you celebrate pride this year i mean <laughs> i haven't it's uh you know I guess pride started as a protest and, um, this year more than ever, it feels like a protest. It feels like, um, yeah, we're in, we're in scary times. So, I mean, I celebrate in, in my own way by trying to be proud and vocal and, uh, create content that people can connect with. And, uh, and then, yeah, um, I really believe in intersectionality. So I, I think that it's a really good time for the LGBT community to come out and, support um black lives matter and trans women and and those kinds of things too so there's a lot going on it's uh it's definitely not the party that it usually is but that's important that's good this is how we make change and also to the fact that art i think we've all um come to appreciate how art can be um political how art can be a form of protest 
when we talk about representation mattering, how valuable would a show like Feel Good have been for you when you were growing up? That's nice. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, th I think it would have been really, I think it would have made a difference because gr growing up, it really was just Alan who, <laughs> who looked like me. And then um, I remember on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, there was a, a lesbian witch. Um, but I think what I would have appreciated is the, the, the nuance of um, identity. Like I'm, I'm bisexual. I'm, I'm non-binary, and I, I, I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen a lot of that. So yeah, it would have, and also I think it would have meant a lot to me that, um, that there was a, a queer show that, that people of all demographics were into that I could have watched with my parents, or, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, as a fan of the show, because we've run out of time, um, I'm hoping <laughs> that maybe you can give us a little bit of a scoop whether or not there's going to be a season two of Feel Good. Listen, I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I'm writing scripts. So if if you did like the show, then now now actually would be a really helpful time to tweet at Netflix and let them know. <laughs> we'll do my part. Yeah, thank <laughs> Martin, you. It's been so nice to meet you. Uh, continued success. And thank you so much for the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for talking to me. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.